Welcome to module five. In this activity, we are going to determine the viscosity of fluid under different conditions. We're going to use something called a dropping ball viscometer, which is basically just you drop a ball in a viscometer. This is obviously a viscometer. What is viscosity? Viscosity is a property of a fluid which indicates its resistance to flow. And sometimes people will just say it's how thick something is. And there is a correlation between uh, thickness and viscosity, but a more precise uh, explanation for it would be specifically that it is the resistance to flow. And viscosity is incredibly important in volcanology because lava counts as a fluid, right? And the viscosity of that fluid changes depending on the conditions that the fluid forms, things like the heat. Also important in volcanology is the viscosity changes the shape and explosivity of the volcano and how it forms and how the eruption unfolds. So it's very important in hazard prediction to know what the viscosity of the lava of the material in that volcano is going to be. Now different viscosities of lava will form different shapes of volcanoes. So if we have a lava with a very low viscosity, so it's a very thin material, we're going to have what's called a shield volcano. And the way that forms is since it's a very thin fluid, if the eruption starts right about here, a lot of the time people think of a volcano as coming out of a pre-existing cone, which can happen, but the volcano had to start somewhere. So when the first eruption happened, you have a relatively uh, flat surface or you have the surface of the earth. And then as the eruption occurs, depending on the thickness, it will pile up differently around the vent. So in the case of a really thin lava or a shield volcano, the thin lava flows outward in layers and you do get a bit of a buildup at the vent, but it's not nearly as drastic as you see in some other types of volcanoes. So once it's erupted for a little while, you end up what is essentially the shape of an upside down shield, which is how you get the name shield volcano. So this is the kind of volcano you're going to get with a very thin, very low viscosity lava. Now let's think about what would happen if we had a really thick, really highly viscous lava. In that case, if we start with the same relatively flat surface, and I emphasize the relatively because very rarely are you going to have a completely flat surface in a volcanic region. Often there have been uh, eruptions from different volcanoes in the same place, but for the purpose of this example, we're going to assume it starts flat. And this time, here's our vent location, and this time we have a really highly viscous, very thick lava. Instead of flowing outward in these long sheets like a shield volcano might do, if it's really thick, it's going to kind of crumple up and pile around the vent much differently. And you're going to get a much steeper slope and a much more of what I would think of as like a classic volcano shape like you see in diagrams in elementary school and things like that. So you might get something more like this. So this would be something more like a composite volcano where you get those steeper edges from the thicker lava piling up around the vent like that. And in these kinds of volcanoes, uh, you also get much more explosive eruptions. Whereas with this kind of volcano, this is a Hawaiian style volcano, you would get more effusive eruptions. And you may remember those terms from previous units. So effusive, much more fluid, uh, thinner lava flow, you're not going to get as much explosive activity and ash. Whereas with this kind of volcano, you're going to get much more ash and those kinds of more serious volcanic hazards. And that has to do with the chemistry of the lava itself, which controls the viscosity. Uh, but that would be a whole nother hour long lecture. So I'm gonna end that train of thought there, but it is very interesting. Now, how are we going to measure our viscosity? The way we are going to measure our viscosity is we are going to test out different viscosities in this very sophisticated, fluid column called a viscometer. My viscometer is very high tech and is clearly not a vase that I put tape on and labeled measurements for uh, because that would be crazy. So as long as we're clear, 
on that. This knot vase is our viscometer and what we were going to do is we are going to take a stopwatch aka my cell phone and we are going to determine the rate at which a marble falls through the fluid that we have in here. I highly recommend making one of these yourself and playing around with it but for the purpose of everyone working with the same data and for your quizzes you're going to get the data you actually do your calculations with from this tutorial video. Okay so let's talk about some of the uh, dreaded math concepts that we have to use for this lab. This is Stokes law. Stokes law. And we are going to have to rewrite it, but let's just go ahead and go over what we have here and break this down. FD is the drag force, specifically the drag force of the fluid on the sphere. So when we have our viscometer, and we have fluid in the viscometer and we're going to drop our ball in there is a drag force associated with the ball falling through our fluid so that's what the FD represents and then the 6 is a 6 and then pi is a mathematical constant that I do not have memorized beyond 3.14 but your calculator has it memorized so you can just put it in your calculator and then mu is the fluid viscosity which is what this lab all revolves around is our fluid viscosity and then V is our velocity so the speed at which it's moving through the fluid and then D is the diameter the diameter of our sphere now we're going to take Stokes law and we're going to rewrite it for our purposes in this lab and the way that we can rewrite this is V equals 2 GR squared now we're going to do parentheses Sphere minus fluid and that all goes over 9 9 mu and this looks a little scary because we have new variables but this G is just gravity which you've probably seen before so G is gravity so that's not so bad and R is just our diameter in half so R is radius and for our gravity value you may remember if you've taken other math or physics classes that gravity on earth is about 9.8 meters per second squared if we were calculating this information for a volcano on a different planet that might not be true but we're doing this on earth so we're still going to use that value that is equal to about 9.8 meters per second squared. This is the density of the sphere and this one is the density of the fluid of our mu just like we had before and that is the same variable so we want to solve for viscosity this is our viscosity variable but this is having a solve for velocity which is not what we want but what we can do is we can just swap these out. So we can just get rid of these guys and we can put velocity here and mu here, our viscosity right here. And now we're solving for viscosity and that is what we want to solve for. So this is going to be the main equation that we're going to use later on. All we really had to do was switch the V and the mu, and we're solving for what we want. So now we can proceed with our actual experiment that we know what uh, formula we're going to be using. Now here's the suspenseful part, which is I am going to take the marble and drop it in, and we're going to time the amount of time it takes to go from this first line all the way down to the finish line. This distance here is what you're going to put as the drop distance 
on your worksheet because we're going to use the exact same vase every time so you don't need to put a new distance every time it's going to be the same distance each and every trial these are our time trials this is the video you're actually going to get your information from so pay attention if you weren't already we have our viscometer and this is our room temperature time trial and really all we're doing is we're going to drop our marble in and time it so we're going to drop it in right now and once it reaches the finish line, that's when we stop our timer. We are now going to do the same thing for trial two, which is our hot temperature trial. We're going to go ahead and drop our marble in in a moment here. This corn syrup has been microwaved. There we go. And you may have noticed it went much faster, right? And lastly, we have our cold time trial where it has been placed in the refrigerator for a few hours. So we are going to go ahead and drop our marble in there. And you can see it's taking much, much longer through the cold corn syrup. So I'm going to do an example calculation of what you'll have to do with uh, your measurements that we collect from the video. None of these variables are the same numbers that you are going to be working with. And this is just so you can see me go through the process with different numbers. Let's talk about what variables you're going to use in your calculations. We are using the distance that the ball drops in our viscometer. And for this example, example calculation, not your real numbers. For example, the distance is 7.8 centimeters is what we're going to use. And the time it took for this example, we're going to say is 1.17 seconds. So to solve for the velocity of this example trial, we're going to use the formula velocity equals distance over time. And then with the numbers we have, we have our distance, which is 7.8 centimeters divided by 1.17 seconds. And then we get 6.67 centimeters per second. And that's going to be our velocity and you're going to add it to the appropriate column on your worksheet. You have a column on your worksheet that says velocity, so this is what that would be for this trial in this example, not your real data. And now we need to solve for viscosity. So we're going to break out the scary equation, which is mu equals 2gr squared density of the sphere minus density of the fluid and then put it all over 9 velocity. To calculate this, we first want to make sure everything is in the correct units. If it's not in the correct units, it's not going to work. This is the information we're going to use for our example. Again, all different than what you're actually going to get for your measurements from the video. But for our G, which is gravity, we're going to be using not 9.8 meters per second squared, we need it in centimeters. So to calculate that, we have our 9.8 meters per second squared, but we need to multiply that times 100 centimeters are in one meter. And then what we get is 981 centimeters per second squared. So we're actually going to be using 981 for our G for this calculation. 981 centimeters per second squared. And then we have our R, our radius, which in this example calculation is going to be 0 0.75 centimeters and it's in a unit we like so we can leave it alone and then our velocity 
which we solved for earlier, is 6.67 centimeters per second squared. And that's in centimeters and seconds, and we like centimeters and seconds, so we can leave that alone. The density of our sphere, so sphere, in this example is going to equal 2.6, and that is in centimeters cubed, which we like. We can leave that alone. The density of our fluid, that is going to equal 1.38 And that is in grams per centimeter cubed, which is also what this is in. So we're going to get rid of that and put grams per centimeter cubed. So to actually calculate this and plug it into our equation, we're going to have mu, so our viscosity, equals 2 times 981, that's our G, times our radius, which is 0 0.75, and we need that squared. And then that is also going to be multiplied by the radius of our sphere, which is 2.6 minus the radius, not the radius, the density of our fluid, which is 1.38. And then lastly, we are going to put all of that over 9 multiplied by our velocity, which is 6 point six seven and if we calculate all of that we're going to get a mu or a viscosity of twenty two point forty four for our example calculation and so this, what you get using this calculation is what would go in your viscosity column on your worksheet, is you would want to do this for every trial and calculate the viscosity using the same process, but with the numbers from the actual experiment video. So let's recap what variables you're going to use in your actual uh, chart. So this is the chart that's going to be in your worksheet. You're going to want to fill it in as you're watching the videos. For the drop distance, that's going to be the same on every trial because we're using the same uh, viscometer for every trial. And that is going to be a distance of 15.24 centimeters. That's your real data from the video. If you look on the side, we have it labeled as what the distance is, and that's 15.24 centimeters. So we're going to write that in all of these boxes because it's going to be the same for every trial. 15.24 centimeters. Now the time is going to be different with each one because cold versus room temperature versus hot is going to have a different uh, viscosity which is going to affect how quickly the marble moves through the uh, corn syrup. So these are all going to be different and you're going to get those from watching the video. And then down here is where you're going to put your velocity, and here is where we're going to put our viscosity measurements once we're done with them. And you're going to use the same process that I just showed you on the example calculation 
to fill in these parts once you've written down the time from watching the video. So now we're going to go over the values of the variables for your calculations. You're going to get the times from watching the video, but I want to make sure you know what your variables are going to be when you plug it into your viscosity calculation. So the gravity is going to be the same as I used the, in the example. So your G is going to be 981 centimeters. The radius we're going to get from measuring the diameter of the marble and dividing that in two. Density of the marble, or the density of our sphere, is 2.16. And in case anyone wants to know how I got that, where you get the density is you drop the marble in water to measure the displacement of the volume, and then you weigh the marble and you can use the formula density equals mass divided by volume to get the density. That's how we get the density of the specific marble that we used, because even a slight change in density can change the end result of our viscosity calculation. The only variables that are going to change when you do your calculations is going to be uh, velocity, which is dependent on the time and the distance, and then that's how you will get your uh, viscosity calculation at the end. So you can go ahead and pause the tutorial video and calculate the viscosity for all three of the trials. Okay, so now we are moving on to part two of the lab. And part two of the lab is where we want to look at the effect of crystallization on the viscosity and uh, the magma movement. Magma isn't just fluid. There are also solid crystals in there. So that's going to change our outcome of our viscosity. So as the melt cools, minerals start to crystallize out of the melt and you stop having just fluid and start having a mixture of fluid and solid crystals. And different minerals have different uh, melting temperatures and therefore uh, crystallization temperatures. So if you start with a hotter magma and it starts to cool, you're going to get certain minerals precipitating out of it. And then as it continues to cool, it stops precipitating as much of this mineral and starts precipitating new minerals, which settle down to the bottom. And that happens progressively with different minerals throughout the lifespan of the magma until it erupts or forms into uh, an igneous pluton or something of that nature. Uh, and that process is called fractional crystallization, which we don't get into a whole lot in this class, but is a very important process in volcanology. If we wanted to make a prediction on how quickly a marble would drop through a crystalline magma, a crystalline mixture instead of a truly fluid mixture, we would have to use a different formula. That's not just the viscosity of the fluid, that is what's called the mu EF or the effective viscosity. So if we want to calculate our effective viscosity, the actual viscosity that is effective in a crystalline magma, we are going to use this formula, mu EF for effective equals mu naught. This is our original viscosity, the viscosity we calculated for the trials before. And then we're going to multiply it by 1 minus 1.35 and then phi raised to negative 2.5. All this is saying is our effective viscosity is equal to original viscosity multiplied by 1 minus 1.35 phi, which is the fractional volume of the crystals, raised to negative 2.5. And fractional volume of the crystals, fractional volume, what that means is the relationship between the number of crystals and the rest of the fluid. So if we have a fluid that contains 10% crystals by volume, that would mean we have a phi or a fractional volume of 0 0.10. So that's what that relationship is and that's what we're using to calculate this number. And this is actually the fractional volume that we will be using uh, in both our example calculation and when you calculate your numbers. This is what we're going to use. So, using the viscosity you calculated in the previous step as mu naught, and specifically the one for room temperature, 
we are going to calculate our effective viscosity. And I'm going to continue with the example calculation I did earlier, which means for that example, our original viscosity was 22.44, right? So I'm going to continue with that, and you're going to use what you calculated in part one for room temperature. And that would make our formula, if we plug it into here, be our mu effective equals 22.44 multiplied by one minus 1.35. And then, like I said, this is going to be our phi uh, because we are assuming that our uh, magma is 10% crystals by volume. So that's what we're going to use for that times 0. And then raise that to negative 2.5. And if we plug that into our nice calculator or into an Excel spreadsheet, that's going to give us an effective viscosity of 32.25. Okay, now that we know the effective viscosity, the general effective viscosity of whatever volcanic system this represents, we can try to calculate uh, information about a potential future eruption or a currently ongoing eruption. So we're going to use Stokes Law rewritten again for that, which you may recall we have mu equals 2 gr squared density of our sphere minus density of our fluid all over 9 times our velocity. And we are going to use this to predict the velocity of the ball dropping into a 10% crystalline mixture. But since we're calculating velocity this, this time, we can swap these out again and get rid of this and get rid of this and put velocity back here and our viscosity back here. And plugging in the info we have from our example, remember mine is all example data, not the real data that you're going to use, we have velocity equals 2 times 981 times 0 0.75 squared times 2.6 minus 1.38 all over 9. But here, we are going to use the effective viscosity we calculated, because the effective viscosity is the viscosity that actually affects the real life volcanic system we're talking about. So that's what we want to use. And we got for that 32.25. And we plug all that information in, we are going to get, if we plug all of that information, we are going to get a velocity of 4.64 would be our velocity. Another bit of information we would want to know is the time it's going to take. So if our velocity is 4.64 centimeters per second, and we want to know how long it's going to take to travel the distance that we were talking about, which in this example was 7.8 centimeters. So we want to know how long this lava would take to travel 7.8 centimeters. And if we have our velocity of 4.64 centimeters per second, we can then calculate the time which comes out to 1.68 seconds.
is how long it would take this particular lava that we're talking about to travel the distance in question, which is 7.8 centimeters. You can use this same method in real life on actual volcanoes to project the time it would take a particular lava that's erupted to travel a certain distance and reach certain uh, milestones or certain areas of uh, high population that you would be interested in knowing when the lava would hit that area. Let's test this out for your data. We're gonna go ahead and drop the marble in one last time with a more highly crystalline fluid. And yes, I did uh, drop the camera on accident and then I picked it back up, so it's fine. This is what you're going to use to double check whether or not our calculations were done correctly. And to expand a little more on why we would care about these particular calculations or why a volcanologist would want to know this, think back to when we were going over our different volcano types caused by the different viscosities, right? If we have a shield volcano, so it ends up being shaped like this and we've got our little vent. And over here, we've got our more steeply sided volcanoes and we've got our vent here. The viscosity determines the type of volcano that forms and therefore also how explosive it is because different kinds of volcanoes are associated typically with different kinds of eruptions. So that is going to have an effect on the death toll. Uh, types of eruptions like you see in Hawaii or on the Reykjanes Peninsula in Iceland where they tend to be more uh, effusive and have a thinner type of lava flow and don't have explosive eruptions they also do not tend to have as high of a death toll because the most uh, dangerous volcanic hazards are going to be the explosive types when you have a lot of ash or you have a lot of pyroclastic flow and things like that. When you have a lot of lava, that can be a big problem for infrastructure because we can't move buildings, right? So that's why we care about the velocity of the flow. We want to know when it's going to reach a certain area so that we can get people to evacuate. But generally, especially if it's not moving down a particularly steep hill, you can kind of just step out of the way of just lava. You can't do that with ash and pyroclastic flow. Pyroclastic flow is a lot of volcanic material in a large mass that can move downhill at over 100 kilometers an hour. So we are very invested as volcanologists in trying to predict what kind of eruption will happen from a particular volcanic system. And a big uh, factor in how explosive an eruption is going to be is how viscous the lava is. So that's why we care about these kinds of calculations. Okay, that is the end of the lab. Please let your TA know if you have uh, any questions and I hope you had a great time learning about magma viscosity with me.